Recognition of Respiratory Failure and Shock in Children by Dr. Monica Kleinman. Hello, my name is Dr. Monica Kleinman from Boston Children's Hospital, and today I'm going to be talking about the recognition of shock and respiratory failure, two of the conditions that commonly lead to cardiac arrest in children. What I would like to do is quickly review the epidemiology and outcomes of pediatric resuscitation in the in-hospital setting then concentrate on the recognition of shock and respiratory failure as two, two conditions that lead to cardiac arrest. And by recognizing and intervening early, these are both strategies for the prevention of in-hospital cardiac arrest, which has a very pro poor prognosis for children. Epidemiology of Pediatric In-Hospital Cardiac Arrest We've fortunately made progress in the past 10 years. This data from approximately 10 years ago shows that about one in 1,000 children suffered a cardiac arrest after admission to the hospital outside of a critical care area. And this was about three times as often as a respiratory arrest. The good news is that survival from in-hospital pediatric cardiac arrest has progressively increased since the 1980s and now stands at over 40%. This is due to progress in resuscitation science itself and the techniques of resuscitation, but also due to earlier recognition. And as pediatricians, one of our roles is to try to prevent life-threatening problems in children. This can be done by recognizing the pre-arrest states. The most recent data reveal that over 40% of children who suffer a cardiac arrest in hospital will survive to hospital discharge. We need to strive to continue to improve this number, as well as to decrease the number of children who actually suffer in hospital arrest. When looking at large data sets, it turns out that the cause of cardiac arrest in pediatric patients in the hospital is just as likely to be cardiac failure or shock as it is to be respiratory insufficiency. This goes against some of the conventional wisdom for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, which is more commonly due to respiratory problems. And when it is due to hypotension, it's typically due to trauma. Again, in the hospital, it is equally likely that shock or respiratory failure will be the antecedent event to a cardiac arrest. For this reason, we need to be able to recognize both conditions in its early stages. One more set of data before we go into the clinical signs. This is uh, information from a large data set, administrative data set, looking at the cause of cardiac arrest. Notice that the primary, the leading cause of cardiac arrest when this was done by etiology was actually sepsis. Again, a cause of shock that pediatricians must be able to recognize in order to prevent further deterioration. Recognizing respiratory distress in failure. Let me first do some definitions, and I'm going to start with respiratory distress and failure, something that most pediatricians are very familiar with and also something that is extremely common as a presenting symptom in children. When we say respiratory distress, we're really referring to the use of compensatory mechanisms to maintain adequate oxygenation and ventilation when something, one of many things, is causing respiratory compromise. Typically, the compensation consists of an increase in the rate and work of breathing. That increase will increase minute ventilation, allowing the child to exhale more carbon dioxide when gas exchange is impaired. Signs of respiratory distress include retractions, sternal retractions, for instance, because of the flexible compliant breastbone, as well as intercostal retractions and this is an example of increased effort resulting in uh, muscles exaggerating the spaces between the ribs or in the sternum. Use of accessory muscles, such as the strap muscles in the neck, nasal flaring, and grunting, an expiratory no noise that's designed to apply some peep. Children in respiratory distress typically are anxious, uh, this is an uncomfortable feeling, and with that stress, they oftentimes have tachycardia. These are some examples as well of signs of respiratory distress. The child who wants to sit upright and is unable to lie flat comfortably. The child in the left looks anxious, and the child in the right is demonstrating increased work of breathing. 
Respiratory failure, on the other hand, is at the other end of the spectrum and is defined by inadequate oxygenation and ventilation. Essentially occurs when compens compensatory mechanisms fail to maintain gas exchange. Interestingly, respiratory failure can occur without preceding respiratory distress, meaning it can happen when there is depression of respiratory effort, typically by uh, something like a poisoning, which depresses mental status, or seizures, or severe weakness, leading to inadequate respiratory effort. Signs of respiratory failure when the compensatory mechanisms are no longer able to sustain gas exchange include desaturation or cyanosis despite supplemental oxygen, the appearance of increased effort leading to poor air entry, in other words, lots of work for very little gain. This may be characterized by a sound of gasping when the child inspires, <sighs> head bobbing, which is an exaggerated uh, form of uh, accessory muscle use in which the head literally will bob as the muscles of the neck and shoulders are trying to participate in gas exchange. Seesaw or paradoxical respirations where the abdomen and chest move in the opposite ways than they usually do. And sounds of severe obstruction, such as strider. The hallmark of respiratory failure to distinguish it from respiratory distress is a change in mental status. When oxygen levels fall and carbon dioxide rises, this is a very stressful feeling and results in sympathetic stimulation and agitation. As carbon dioxide continues to rise, it has a sedating effect on the central nervous system, leading to a child who's lethargic, sleepy, or obtunded. The child who appears to have increased work of breathing, desaturation, and sleepiness or obtundation is one in whom you need to be very concerned, has transitioned from respiratory distress to respiratory failure, and may progress to respiratory arrest and cardiac arrest. If left untreated, respiratory failure will progress to cardiorespiratory failure, meaning although it is primarily a problem of ventilation and oxygenation, having hypoxia and having acidosis from poor ventilation will depress the heart and result in cardiac failure as well. Signs of cardiorespiratory failure include a decrease in respiratory effort, cyanosis, bradycardia, and unresponsiveness. This is clearly a pre-arrest state and one that may only last for seconds to minutes before the child suffers a cardiac arrest. This illustrates the relationship that multiple etiologies can result in respiratory distress. And oftentimes the child's ability to compensate will prevent the progression to respiratory failure. However, if respiratory failure occurs over minutes or hours, it needs to be recognized and addressed quickly or the child will progress to cardiorespiratory failure and in a matter of minutes, progress to cardiac arrest. Once a child has had cardiac arrest, the chances of successful resuscitation, as we've shown in hospital, is only about 40%. Recognizing shock. Now we're going to switch to talking about shock. Shock, or circulatory failure, is defined as inadequate delivery of oxygenated blood to the tissues to meet metabolic demands. So it's an imbalance in demand and supply. If you look at the components of oxygen delivery, it is a combination of the cardiac output or liters per minute of blood flow that the heart is pumping and the arterial oxygen content, how much oxygen can be carried in a milliliter of blood. In most patients, the contribution of dissolved oxygen is very small compared to oxygen carried on hemoglobin. But in the case of severe anemia, the contribution from dissolved oxygen may be significant. Going further into these hemodynamic relationships, oxygen delivery is in part dependent on cardiac output. Cardiac output is a combination of a patient's heart rate and stroke volume. That is the volume of blood ejected with each contraction of the heart. Stroke volume has three contributing factors. One is preload, 
which is the volume of blood that's in the ventricle prior to ejection. Another is contractility, which is the strength of the ejection. And the final one is afterload, which is the resistance against which the heart is pumping. Another way to look at that is that that's the arterial blood pressure against which the left ventricle is pumping. Now, what about blood pressure? Blood pressure, in turn, is related to cardiac output with the components we just reviewed and systemic vascular resistance. Like any engineering equation, pressure is flow times resistance. The way that we translate this for patient care is that a patient who is able to maintain blood pressure because of adequate cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance or the compensatory mechanisms that help to maintain them is called someone in compensated shock. Whereas once the patient becomes hypotensive, that's a state of decompensation and we call that hypotensive shock. As an example of uh, uh, normal values that you may use to determine if a patient is hypotensive, for children who are at least a year of age, the minimum systolic blood pressure is approximately 70 plus two times the age in years. Below that, a patient is considered hypotensive. There are three primary types of shock, and although there are some uh, other types that are very uncommon, we're going to focus on these. The first is hypovolemic, and the primary problem there is low cardiac output due to low preload. The patient will compensate for low cardiac output by increasing heart rate and then increasing systemic vascular resistance in an effort to maintain blood pressure. An example of this would be severe fluid losses from something like gastroenteritis or hemorrhage from trauma. Distributive shock, its primary derangement is low systemic vascular resistance, and there may also be a degree of capillary leak leading to low preload or hypovolemia. So distributive shock can have several, uh, several characteristics of the other forms of shock as well. When SVR is low, the initial response of the body is tachycardia. Unfortunately, because of the presence of uh, uh, toxins or other substances like inflammatory markers from anaphylaxis, one isn't able to then reverse that low SVR and it remains uh, in a vasodilated state. Examples of this are sepsis and anaphylaxis. Finally, cardiogenic shock, the primary derangement is low contractility from a number of different potential causes. And the compensatory mechanisms are tachycardia and vasoconstriction or increased SVR. Examples of this are a patient with myocarditis or someone who has suffered a cardiac arrest and whose heart is not functioning well. You can see that hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock can look very similar in terms of the clinical signs, meaning their compensatory mechanisms. But a patient with hypovolemia typically has a, a history or an exam that suggests why they have inadequate preload. And a patient with cardiogenic shock typically lacks that type of history and may also have signs of congestion like hepatomegaly. When you consider all types of shock, there are some signs in common with some differences depending on the specific etiology. Tachycardia is almost universally present with the exception of neurogenic shock, which may happen from spinal cord injury. Most forms of shock result in increased systemic vascular resistance or vasoconstriction. The exception being septic shock or anaphylaxis where there is profound vasodilation. When you have increased SVR, the physical signs include cool extremities, delayed capillary refill, and diminished distal pulses. You will also see signs of end organ dysfunction. For instance, changes in mental status, such as confusion or agitation, which could progress to lethargy or obtundation and over time, decreased urine output. When there's inadequate oxygen delivery, the resultant metabolic acidosis leads to tachypnea in an effort to compensate with a respiratory alkalosis. Finally, hypotension, which is a late sign of shock in most situations, may occur.
Now, one has to keep in mind a very common form of shock in hospitalized children, which is septic shock, sometimes also referred to as warm shock. Here, the primary derangement is low systemic vascular resistance, and there is compensation with tachycardia. But because of the low systemic vascular resistance, the patient, instead of having cool skin, has warm skin, may even appear flushed. They have strong or bounding pulses and brisk capillary refill because this is a state of vasodilation. The problem being that too much blood flow is being sent to the periphery and the skin and not enough to the vital organs. So one still sees impaired end organ function, such as changes in mental status or urine output, and development of metabolic acidosis and compensatory tachypnea. Hypotension can be an early sign of shock in the setting of sepsis because of the vasodilation. This illustrates those relationships, again, multiple forms of shock with compensatory mechanisms leading to compensated shock, ultimately decompensated or hypotensive shock, which can rapidly progress to cardiorespiratory failure and cardiac arrest. To remind you, cardiorespiratory failure occurs when shock is left untreated leading to both respiratory failure and shock. Signs of cardiorespiratory failure include decreased respiratory effort, cyanosis, bradycardia, and unresponsiveness. In summary, it's important for pediatric providers to be able to recognize shock and respiratory failure, which are the two common pathways by which children typically progress to cardiorespiratory failure and cardiac arrest. With early recognition and intervention, and prevention of cardiac arrest, we can improve outcome for patients. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.